Bibles this morning, book of Deuteronomy in chapter number 15, Deuteronomy chapter number 15. I've been doing this uh, series of messages that I'm calling, Where Is Your Heart? And uh, uh, I, I kind of like to preach through the Bible every year uh, based on a subject or a topic, but I just preach through the Bible every year. And, um, uh, I've been doing it for a number of years that way. Right now, uh, normally, I should probably be already in the New Testament, and I am still in, in my series. Uh, of course, we had a month or two of uh, version, but uh, um, but I'm still in the book of Deuteronomy. So we're probably at some point make a pretty big leap that's going to get us in the New Testament. I, uh, but I just there's there's some really important material, some really important things to be found in the book of Deuteronomy and uh, in the Old Testament, especially these early books in the Old Testament that I, I have felt like we really needed to hear uh, what the Lord has to say uh, in these passages. So we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 15 today. And if you found your place, if you're able, I'd like to invite you to stand. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 10 this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. I do want to say thank you to Brother Orozco for doing the... Uh, for bringing the, the Wednesday night message. I didn't get to hear all of it. Uh, I did turn it on for uh, a moment and heard the, 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 like the final close. And then my wife told on him and said that you had ice cream. And, uh, and just, uh, so I don't know, maybe we should just dismiss right now and have ice cream. And yeah, I'm kidding, we won't do that. So Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. The Bible says, at the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. This is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact of it, exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it's called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, but that which is thine with thy brother, thine hand shall release, save when there shall be no poor, no more, no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee uh, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. If there be among you a poor man of one of the, thy brethren with any of the, within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not hearken, or I'm sorry, thou shalt not harden thy heart, uh, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and thou shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Beware that there... Be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of the release is at hand, and thine evil eye be, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not, and cry unto the Lord against, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thy heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. And let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, I want to ask you today that you will bless uh, the reading of your word. And now, Lord, as we begin to examine this passage of Scripture, try to see if we can um, to break it down a little bit and see some things that uh, we can apply to our own lives, see the, the lessons that are found here, and then find application for our, our own lives. I want to pray, Heavenly Father, for your blessings. I want to pray, God, that you'd open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law, and that you'll help us that we'd want to be responsive to you. Um, we don't... It, 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 we don't need today to be stirred so much emotionally. None of that needs to happen. But what does need to happen is we need to clearly see the truth in your word. And then we need to uh, honestly respond to uh, the message that you have for us today. And I want to ask you, God, that you would work today, that you'll use the message. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Just kind of remind you about where we're, what we've been saying, and I know this will be a little bit of review because we've been here in the book of Deuteronomy. I think that's the third message out of the book of De Deuteronomy. But Moses is making his, his final address to the children of Israel before he dies. God said he mustn't die. Uh, he's led the children of Israel over the, through the wilderness all of these 40 years. 
uh, and uh, to the word the promised land, but Moses is not going to enter into the promised land. He must die. Previous God did give him the privilege of climbing a mountain where he would be able to see all of the land that, that was promised to the people of Israel, but Moses wasn't allowed to go in. And, and But pre prior to uh, his death, before the children of Israel, um, kind of graduated into a brand new leader from Moses to Joshua before all of that happened, God gave Moses the opportunity to gather the people together and to uh, rehearse, review with them all that had happened in the last 40 years and the lessons that God had given to the people of Israel during those 40 years. His audience, uh, in this case, is the children of Israel. It's the children of the original generation of Jews that had left um, Egypt and escaped the slavery there. This is these are the children. Everyone 20 years old and, and, and older of that original group that left Egypt has died off. And because they came to the, to the border of, uh, of the promised land in Kadesh Barnea and they rejected the promise of God at that place, then God determined that all of them that were old enough to make that decision and reject God's will, uh, that they would all die in the, in, in the wilderness. And all that, now this new generation that Moses is giving the book of Deuteronomy to, these are the children of those who had died off. They had watched as, um, as their parents, one by one, expired in the wilderness, walking around in circles, out in the desert wilderness, walking around in circles, and, uh, and, uh, and, and dying off because of famine, or because of plague, or because of natural causes, one by one. Every one of those Jews, 20 years old and up, had died. Everyone except for Joshua and Caleb, and at this point, there, Moses was still alive, but he's not. He's going to pass before they enter the Promised Land as well. This is so. This is a generation of uh, of people who have witnessed the mighty hand of God again and again and again during these wilderness wanderings. These are the ones who saw their shoes not wear out. These are the ones who uh, ate of the manna in the wilderness that God provided for them day in and day out, provided for them uh, food. They had seen God, God's hand at work in judgments. They had seen God's hand at work in mercy. They had seen God's hand at work in, in combat. There were at least two uh, times that they, they, they uh, Israel had to fight in battle, and they had witnessed as God gave them victories in combat. They had seen the hand of God work at work again and again and again. This was a this was a generation of Israel who would be blessed to enter into the promised land. A, again, a privilege that not even Moses is going to experience. And still Moses says something in verse 9 of this passage. He says that they had wicked hearts. You won't meet anyone who's had more opportunity to walk with God than this generation of Jews. They worshiped at the tabernacle. They followed the pillar of fire uh, by night and the pillar of cloud by day. They've heard the, the teachings of Moses. They have uh, seen where God uh, uh, you know, judged when it was appropriate and they have seen where God blessed when, um, when, they, when they were obedient and when they repented. They, they, they know God. They have seen God. They have walked with God for these 40 years. These are the ones who are going to be privileged to enter into God's promised land. And yet Moses says of them that they have wicked hearts. Huh. Um, give a couple of, this is, I'm going to, this is getting a little bit um, personal with us. I'm, uh, hopefully it will be okay uh, for me to do this. But a few years ago, not many, a few years ago, I was speaking with someone from the church, uh, from this church, that I thought was a, a trusted friend and, and, and prayer partner. He was someone who uh, wanted to pray with me, frequently would ask me to, to pray with him, and uh, and uh, would regularly call on me to pray and would say, Pastor, I want to pray for you. What, what specifically can I pray for you about? And in fact, he was real big on that. that uh, I want to know, I want to be able to pray specific. Tell me something specific to pray about. He wanted things to pray for specifically. And one day, uh, in one of those uh, times of prayer, I said, uh, I asked him if he would um, pray for a certain person who I said was doing wickedly. And uh, a few days later, that person that I said was doing wickedly contacted me. 
Why do you believe I am wicked? So I learned a couple of lessons right there. I learned that when a person offers, offers to pray and asks if there are any specific requests, he may not be sincere. He may have an ulterior motive besides wanting to honestly pray. And secondly, I learned it's best to bring a person's names to God alone. And you know that I am pretty free with names, both positively and negatively when I'm preaching. But uh, it's often best to bring names to God alone unless you don't mind if that person confronts you <laughs> when you mention their name. Um, but you know what really shocked me about this? It was that this guy was offended that I called him wicked. I thought that was a preacher's job. I did. I, I thought that was my job. My, my job is not to look in, in, and to say, well, you know, these are all the things you're doing right. Just keep doing that. My job is to help you see areas that need to be corrected. Um, would it offend you for to know that I think all of us are wicked? <laughs> Myself included. <laughs> If you wanted to give me an opportunity to get into a conversation and I felt like I could trust you with the conversation, I could list, I could list things that we can about everyone in here in this room. <laughs> You're not right with God. No, I'm not right with God either. I'm not saying I'm better than you. I mean, we all have places to grow. That is part of the reason why we become the house of the so that we can so that we can grow. And uh, uh, you know, here's this guy is, you know, offended. What would you think is wicked about me? Let me count the ways. Anyway, so, uh, uh, but it did cause me, it caused me to, to, to consider this question. When is a believer's heart wicked? Moses said, of these people who I would have thought, if you're going to talk about a people who have, who have had a regular walk with God, this is a generation of Israel who have a regular walk with God, and yet Moses says that you have a wicked heart. When is a person's a believer's heart with it. Now, um, the best that any of us can be, we still have a wicked heart. But beside this truth, I think there's there's some specific things that can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 15 that we can point out that are indications of when your heart and mind is betraying its wickedness. Some things that that and again, this is probably this is only one passage, so the list is much larger than this. But we're just going to stay within the passage. And in this passage, I can see three areas where God's word reveals, tells you, your heart and mind could be wicked in these areas. Number one, the, the believer's heart is wicked when we borrow, but we do not lend. Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 6, For the Lord thy God blessed thee, and by the way, we can read the whole passage again. I'm just going to give you the scriptures to kind of remind you of what the context is here. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. Thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. God says he's going to bless them in such a way. He says, here, I'm going to bless you, and then this is going to be, this is going to be um, the sign of my blessings that you lend it to others, but you do not borrow from others. Now, so notice some Basic elements that are found in this verse. Number one, there is an assumed blessing from the Lord. I'm just going to. I'm just going to. This is just going to throw this right out there. If you don't assume that God is blessing you, your heart is wicked. If, if, if you don't have in your mindset, in your in your spirit, if you don't have that sense where you wake up in the morning and say, "I am blessed of the Lord," I am truly. Bless me. If you're one of those that wakes up and all you can think about are all the problems that you have and all of them, if you can't think of a reason to thank God, you have a wicked heart. So one of the elements of the passage, there's an assumed blessing from the Lord, and that blessing is in direct answer to the, to the promises of God. So I know some people who can say, well, I'm blessed because, you know, I'm smart and I can work hard. I'm blessed because, you know, I've got a good family. I'm blessed because of this. I'm blessed because of... And they can, you know, they list off a lot, you know, a lot of people, Thanksgiving is like that. Thanksgiving is, you know, for the country that we live in and for the uh, bounty that we have. And, but, but... But, but uh, giving thanks to God would never be a, a, a thought of their mind, would never come across their mind. And uh, so he says there is a, a, an assumed 
blessing here, and the blessing is in direct promise, or is direct answer to the promises of God. Listen, God is at work in your life. Whether you're a saved person or a lost person, whether you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, or whether you think the whole religious thing is just a bunch of hooey, it doesn't matter. God blesses you day in and day out. The fact that you can breathe is a blessing from God. The fact that your heart pumps is a blessing from God. And the fact that you uh, do have a mind that is able to uh, to put things together and work uh, is a blessing from God. You, you have blessings from God every single day. And not to wake up and say, well, you know what? I'm thankful that I woke up. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my kids. Or I'm thankful for the food or whatever. But if you can't come to a place where you say, I am thankful to God for these things, there's just something wicked about that. If you can't see that God is blessing you and that the, and that the blessings that you possess are, are, are a direct, directly from the promises of God. It's not because you live in the land of plenty. It's because of God who gives you plenty. So there is an assumed blessing from the Lord in the passage. There's also that the blessing is in direct answer to God's promise. And then uh, there is a I don't know if this is the, I'm just going to say, there is also an authority possessed by the lender over the, the borrower in the passage. He says, um, thou shalt uh, lend unto many nations, thou shalt, but thou shalt not borrow. Thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. There's an, there's an authority possessed by the lender over the borrower. That's part of that passage. So I want to, just based on, I wanna, now I'm going to give to you another passage of scripture. You don't have to turn here if you don't want to. I want you to, because we're going to stay here in the book of Deuteronomy. But I want to read another passage to you today. This is in the book of Genesis, chapter 14. I'm going to read verses 14 through 23. This passage has to do with Abram. And uh, it has to do, at, at this point in Abram's life, his nephew Lot has separated from him. He's gone down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And while he's been down there um, uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah, there is an attack on Sodom and Gomorrah for five, from five different kings. And, and Lot and his family have been taken captive. Lot has left the land of God. He has left the blessing of God for a place where he thinks he's, he can be successful on his own. And while there, he is taken captive. Abraham comes to his rescue. That's kind of the, the background of the story. When Abraham, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them uh, unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that uh, were with him in the valley of Sheba, which is in the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto him, said unto Abram, Give, give me thy, the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latch that which I will, um, um, and I will not take anything that is mine, lest thou shouldst say, I have made Abram rich. So here's, okay, um, Lot purposely chose to live in Sodom and Gomorrah because it looked like a place of plenty. It looked like a place of wealth. The promised land, uh, you know, where Abram was, it was a land where you could graze cattle, you could feed your cattle up there, and you could grow, uh, you know, you could have sheep and, uh, and cattle and those sorts of things. But he looked down there to the well-watered plains, and that looked like a place where a person could get rich. So all of a sudden now, Sodom and Gomorrah, he goes down there because that's a place he looks and says, man, that's a, that is a place a guy can do well for himself. And he goes down there to the, uh, to the, to the world, if you would, to Sodom and Gomorrah, and um, there he is attacked. He's taken, a lot is taken away, uh, and Sod the king of Sodom is taken. All that pe all of the wealth of Sodom is taken away with, uh, uh, with the king's chevalier and the five, four others that are with him. And Abram takes his, this, 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 Farmer, this nomad, takes his servants and chases down five kings. 
whoops the stuffing out of him, rescues the king of Sodom, rescues all of that wealth and all of those goods and all of the people, and he brings it back. When they come back, the king of Sodom says, listen, if you'll just give me back the people, you're on, I'm the king of these people. If you'll just let me have them back to reign, I'll let you have all of the wealth. I'll let you have all of the spoils, all of the goods, all of the wealth. And remember, we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. These are wealthy places. You can have all of the goods. You can have all of the wealth. Just let me be the king still. And uh, Abram, here's what he said. He said, uh, no, I'm not going to take a thing because I don't want you, Sodom, to be able to claim you made me rich. I don't want anything from the world. I don't want this world to ever be able to say that it has been a blessing to me. That anything in the world has made me rich, has made me wealthy, that, uh, that I am who I am because of something in the world. He didn't want that to happen. Um, some of you heard me say, have heard me say that uh, when I was in, in Bible college, a professor uh, remarked how, how much the ministry had changed in the 30 years that he had been preaching. I was in Bible college, he'd taken 30 years, and we're talking about, so I was in Bible college, it was 19, this would have been like 1981, 1982, 30 years, 50 years, before 1950, I was, I was uh, born in 1958, so I'm thinking from the time I was born until the time I was in Bible college, he said the ministry had changed so much in that period of time that, that you know, it wasn't even the same job anymore. Being in the ministry from the time I was born to the time I was in Bible college, it changed that much. And I thought, how in the world? The world hasn't changed that much in 50 years. Well, I've been in the ministry, uh, real, it's, it's coming on to 40 years now. I'm just going to tell you something. This world is nowhere near the same place it was. The ministry is nothing like it was in 1983, 84 when I started pastoring. Things have changed in mentalities, mindsets, uh, not only in the world, but in churches. Uh, not only about the people you go out and try to win to the Lord, you know, how you uh, try to reach people and try to give them the gospel and invite them and things like that they into the house of the Lord. Th uh, that's changed. But the other thing that's changed is how people who are in independent fundamental Baptists think. Uh, uh, um, it's just changed so much. One of the ways that it's changed is... And when I became a Christian, preachers taught us. When I was in Bible college, when I went to church, or began going to church, I did grow up in, in, in church. It was happened after I was already a young adult, and when I got saved and started going to church. But when, when my wife and I started going to church, got saved, started living for the Lord, going to church, when we went to Bible college and those sorts of things, one of the things that we were taught is that you do not accept government handouts. I mean, we were taught that welfare was wrong. To accept, we were we were taught not to accept government assistance uh, to help pay medical expenses. You know, they, uh, we had medical problems, but if you if you went to the government to get help for those medical problems, you know that's you know you're saying that God couldn't take care of you. You're if you did that. Uh, we were taught not even to accept unemployment benefits. <laughs> Honestly, I you, I could get kicked out of school for those things. Out of Bible college for those things back in those days. Because the idea was is we were trained to be men of God. And as men of God, we uh, didn't, we wanted to have a testimony that God took care of us, that God met our needs, that that and that, that we didn't need the government to help us with those things. But um, over the course of time, that has changed more and more where people, even those in the ministry, you know, have a need and the government has some kind of program. So all of a sudden, you know, you can be a part of that program. When this thing happened this year and the government put out that, um, uh, is it called PPP? Um, you know, it's one of those things that um, you, know, I, you look at it and then the government's going to give this money to help pay for your, you know, and... Uh, and so you could pay your employees and keep them on, on uh, you know, get on the payroll through all of the shortcomings and so forth. And they even opened it up so that churches and religious institutions could could use it and so forth. And uh, you know, I, I would I chose not to. First of all, I wouldn't have done it because of you know not only my training. I don't want to let the world you know uh, uh, think that it that God's work needs the government to help it, even in the time of crisis. But uh, uh, even colleges training our future preachers. Took that money. Setting an example that 
that money is okay. It's there if you can have it. It's, a, uh, it's just a change in, in understanding and application of the word of God. So in uh, one of the ways, that, the difference um, in generations can have. So um, I'm from the 70s slash 80s. I got saved in the 70s and was trained for the ministry in the early 80s. And uh, in my day, um, the, the um, ministry that was there, the legal ministry that was there to help us was the Christian Law Association, David Gibbs, Jim, Christian Law Association. And, uh, he's, that ministry started slightly before I entered into the ministry, why, before I started living for the Lord. And, and uh, so I have supported the Christian Law Association since even before I was a pastor. And uh, while I was going to Bible college, we gave monthly money to uh, to Christian Law Association. And, and every pastor that I've had uh, in Astoria and here, uh, we support Christian Law Association. And we've got that. Christian Law Association, when things happen of a legal nature, I contact Christian Law Association. Now, uh, David Gibbs Jr. is the founder and head of Christian Law Association. His son, David Gibbs III, is the founder and head of an organ similar organization called uh, NCLL, National Council for Life and Liberty. And uh, um, so here's this P, is it called PPE, I think. And uh, so David Gibbs Jr., the guy that is my generation, warned preachers, do not take that money. I know it's tempting, but it looks good. Do not take that money. The thing that we were taught back then, this was even Jerry Falwell was the one who taught this. Jerry Falwell, almost everybody called him a liberal compromiser. But Jerry Falwell would part on it. Do not take government money. Do not take government money. Do not take government money. He said it like this. He said, with shekels come shackles. Do not take government money. Government does not give money away free, ever, ever, ever. You know, this is free money, and if you just use it the way we tell you to use it, uh, you won't even have to pay it back. It's free money. And David Gibbs Jr. said, don't take that money. It's a trap. That thing's going to be a trap. Now, I don't know that it's trapped anyone yet, but he, don't take that money. David Gibbs III from National Center of Life and Liberty said, this money is a good deal. Take that money. Dad says, warning, warning, warning. Son said, no, nah, it's going to be fine. I've already looked into it. It's going to be fine. It's just a different mindset. We, as, as time has over the 30, 30 years, 36 years I've been in the ministry, there has, be, there has come a different mindset about what makes, what constitute be, making the ministry rich or not. And it used to be in my day, they say, no, you don't take money from me, and you don't take money from the world, because the world will claim that, they, that, the, that God couldn't have supplied for you. The world will claim that you, that he, that the world will claim, see, it wasn't God that did that, it was us that did that. It wasn't God that did that, it was some government program that did it. It wasn't God that did that, it was the president who did it. It wasn't God who did that. It was a, the legislature that did it. It wasn't God that did it. It was the banks that paid for that or whatever it's going to be like that. And, uh, and, that was the, and they would say, don't do that. Don't do that. You want to maintain a testimony that God can take care of you, that God can take care of you. And I can say this, that in the 36 years that I've been in the ministry, and I think my wife would agree that, uh, we, that, that I do not believe, I'm not trying to build myself up or anything. I know that I'm not a, the greatest preacher, and I know that I don't pastor the greatest, biggest, the baddest church in the whole world, but I can say this. In 36 years of ministry, we have never accepted government money. We have one time I thought about buying, a, I, I thought about getting into a government lending, lending house. One time. God got me under such conviction. I'm going to tell the story. I've told it before. I'm going to tell it again. So we were starting the church in that story, and you know we're living in a in a in a hundred year old Victorian duplex that I was sure was going to burn up and kill my whole family. We, I was sure we were going to die in that house. Every night I would pray, God, please don't let this house start on fire tonight. Honestly, this house was we. Um, uh, the refrigerator, the kitchen, they was, you know, because it was in the Victorian days when it was built, uh, our refrigerator um, was had the plug in. What they'd done in the basement is they had taken one of those orange extension cord cord cords that you buy from Home Depot, they cut off both ends, and one end they had wired into the box, they swung it over nails in the in the basement, and the other end uh, came through a hole drilled in the floor, and that was what our refrigerator was plugged into. The whole house was that kind of thing. I just knew it was down. The windows, we all the bedrooms were upstairs, but they're all painted shut. You can't open them. 
Please, God, don't let this house start on fire. And so we've heard about this program. I can't even remember the name of it now. We've heard about this program where uh, if you qualify for it, you can get a brand new two-bedroom or three-bedroom house with two baths or something like that. And uh, the interest rate was only like a, a 1%. And uh, so the repayments were like, you know, dirt cheap. And so we thought, well, you know, uh, and, and I heard about it, Pastor had done. So I went ahead and, and uh, went and checked into it. And sure enough, we qualified. And, and uh, you know, they had to go through a process. It takes weeks to go through the process. And so, you know, but the whole time I'm doing it, I'm thinking, wait a minute, is this, wouldn't I have gotten kicked out of college for this? Isn't this letting the government take care of me? But no, I mean, this other pastor's got one of those houses and, you know, and besides that, we're going to die in this house that we're living in. And, you know, and so if they can do it, I can do it. And, and that's what I said. So I went ahead and I fought, fill out the paperwork and we're waiting, you know, and they call you up and they ask you questions. You know how that works, you know, the, the, the whole loan thing is a humiliating experience, you know, and asking this question, that question, you know, and uh, who was your uncle's father? How much did he make? And who can you borrow money from? And that kind of stuff. And, and they go through this whole process and, and every time I hear from them, I get them under conviction, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing this. But I'm thinking to myself, I got a wife and a son at the time, and we're living in a house that's going to burn up, if the house catches on fire, I'd never be able to get in and rescue my kid, and uh, you know, we're going to die in this house, and it'd be right for us saying, we're serving the Lord, and God, you ought to just let me have the house, because I deserve it. And and, uh, and so, you know, but I'm under conviction, those days we were so poor, we didn't even have, there was, we had no phone, either at our house or at the church building, and, and um, anyway, so we're filling out paperwork, we're doing this, and, and um, um, and then there's the issue we found a house that would qualify. But, but once you qualify, then you have to find a house that you want to get live in that qualifies. And that's a process that goes through that. It takes several weeks to go through that. And every time they ask questions, it's in my mind a conviction. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do this. But I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. And uh, this was going through what, you know, all this was happening. And, uh, and, uh, and then one day, um, uh, I got something that. And another thing to fill out, and uh, I'm doing my devotions, and I'm thinking, and, and I'm under conviction, I cannot, oh, the other thing that happened. Bo got sick, we had a little baby. We woke up one morning, him crying, and he was covered head to toe with little pink dots. Little, looks like bug bites and things, head to toe. And I know, you know, people, there are there is such a thing as sand fleas, and there's such a thing as roseola, I think is what it's called. Now, there's stuff that people get, but when I saw him, my first thought was, God is judging me because I'm trying to get that house. No, 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 that's stupid. People get stuff. And uh, I kept filling out paperwork. One morning I got up to go to my car. My car, there's a big puddle of, of uh, antifreeze underneath the car. And I know, you know, things happen to cars, especially for preacher's cars that don't ever get any maintenance. So things happen to cars. But my first thought was, God is judging me because I'm going to get this house. I'm trying to get this house. And no, 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 that's stupid. And, uh, you know, I pay to get that fixed. And anyway, so uh, I get this thing one day. There's, and I get under conviction and I, I get a hold of me and I come home to an and, and, you know, and now I'm going to have to tell her that uh, I'm, and I need to, uh, I'm going through this process. I need to, God has just struck me with conviction. We cannot go through with this house. We have to back. We have to stop this. And she said, well, you're going to have to tell the real estate agent because they just sent me in for the word that we got the house. We just got in. So I had to call them and say, um, after we just got approved, I'm sorry, we're not going to take the house. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so Nina wasn't very happy with it. It only cost us $100, it cost us $100 worth of earnest money and $150 for the new part of my car. And whatever the doctor fee was to take over to get his Rosilla taken care of. But, uh, uh, that whole, you know, again, the idea of just uh, not, we're not going to let the world take care of just how things have changed over the course of time. And, you know, we don't, uh, we, Abraham said, I'm not going to let the world claim that it has taken care of me. And, uh, and just one of those areas that's, that places change, the world's changed. God tells his believers, he tells his people to be lenders, not borrowers. You know, um, a uh, few things about borrowing. Borrowing, number one, is a sign of covetousness. Um, we're not satisfied with what God has provided, so we find a source outside of God to get what we want and that God wouldn't give. Uh, borrowing, number two, is a lack of gratefulness. We are uh, not thankful for what God has given us, and we're only happy when we can 
get something someone else has. Uh, borrowing is a, is a lack of gratefulness. Borrowing and not lending is a lack of faith. So if we're borrowing, but we're not willing to lend to give, that's a lack of faith. There's a, a lack of trust in God when we don't believe that he will use us as a vessel through which he, his blessings can flow to others. That is where he wants you and me to be. He wants us to live in a state where we are channels of his blessing. Not receivers, but we're givers. It's more blessed to give than to receive. We are to bring ourselves in our spiritual life to a place where we, are, so that we are in a place where we can be channels of his blessing. And, and, and if we're always, in a, you know, we're just, you know, we live in that state where, you know, I can't give, I still need. And uh, then what you're doing is you're saying, well, God hasn't taken care of me so that I can be who he wants me to be. Another thing about uh, borrowing versus lending is a tool for spiritual growth. Giving really is a means to learn to let God let God's blessings flow through you. Um, uh, and when you start giving and you see God letting God's blessings flow through you, it creates in you spiritual growth. Um, and, and it, blessings and giving is more than material things, more than money and so forth. Uh, it's the blessing, giving the giving the blessing of the grace of God or uh, giving the message of salvation or uh, uh, sharing your faith so that someone else, my faith passes on to someone else. So one of the things that happens and one of the reasons why Faith Promise, the missions program, is so important is because when you see that if that as you're led the Spirit of God to give to missions and that God provides for you, it teaches you that, that, that you can never outgive the Lord. You can't outgive Him financially. You can't give them out, give them faithfully. You can't give them out, give him mercifully. You can't out, give him. So listen, if you can, if you can learn that you can't out, give God financially, you can also learn that you can never forgive too much. You can always forgive. You can always be merciful. You can always be gracious. Because as you will forgive, and as you are merciful, and as you are gracious, God forgives, and God is merciful, and God is gracious to you. He just keeps it coming. Let's go on to the second point here. Believer's heart is wicked. Number two, when we hear, but we do not hearken. Look at verse five. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. So I want to remark, first of all, that... Um, to uh, <clears throat> to hear but not to hear his word but not hearken his word uh, to do that I just lost my place in my notes uh, got found my place here um, it, that is a that is an act of carelessness to hear his word but not hearken his word Daniel said something his son is blessed I like it he said uh, the difference between watching a service and paying attention have you ever watched the sermon. You're here, and there's the preacher, and he's there, and he's saying something. He might be moving around a little bit, and uh, but he gets done, and it has not spoken to you at all. You watch the service. That's not God. God didn't. God didn't intend for you to come week after week after week and watch. He intends for you to come and hearken. In fact, hearken carefully. It's, it's carelessness. He says, only if thou carefully hearken. God wants us to do more than hear. He wants us to carefully hearken to the voice of the Lord. So many people, again, come to church, they sit through the services because they know they should, because they think they're supposed to, or because it's become a habit to them. They hear the voice of the Lord, their God, but they don't hearken to the voice, let alone hearken carefully. I also want to say, uh, to do that, to, to not to hear but not hearken is disobedience. He says, to observe, to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. These are commandments. His word. It's a command. These, and to not do what God's word says is an act of disobedience. They're not suggestions, and none of God's commandments are optional. Um, notice again, he says in that, in that verse, uh, verse 5, he says, uh, there, notice the words, all and only. God's blessings may be ours only when we observe to do his commandments. And God's blessings may be ours only when we observe to do all his commandments. But then consider that obedience to God is more than a means to unlock his blessings. 
and uh, to prevent judgment. Obedience is an act of reverence for your heavenly Father. It is an, it is a, a a means of protection for your soul, and it is a light for the world. Listen, it is a wicked thing for a Christian to not heart carefully harp into the word. God. It is wickedness to not observe to do all that the Lord has commanded. It is wickedness to claim to be a believer and to not live according to the word of God. I mentioned in one of the classes I taught at, uh, at uh, the camp, Martin Luther, one of, when Martin Luther first uh, you know, nailed his 95 thesis up on the wall of the door of the, the chapel at Wittenberg and the Pope uh, uh, got after him and he's gonna, the Pope is gonna kick uh, Martin Luther out of the Catholic Church, out of the, the Catholic priesthood. And Martin Luther says, hey, you can't kick me out, I quit and I'm gonna go start my own church when he does all those things. When Martin Luther first leaves, the Pope is gonna kill him. The Pope wants to capture Martin Luther and kill him. Well, there's a group of Anabaptists in Germany uh, that, that, that hid him, that sheltered Martin Luther and protected his life until he was able to kind of get himself established to a place where he was able to, you know, begin his church in, uh, in, in Germany. And Luther, you know, he had opportunity. He could have at that time, had he chosen, he could have joined up with the Anabaptists. But Luther had two problems with the Anabaptists. Number one was that um, uh, they believed in separation of church and state. They did not believe uh, that um, he did not believe a, a Christian could be compelled to be faithful to church, faithful to the ordinances, and faithful to give unless the government made him do it. So he said, well, this, uh, this is impractical. Uh, you, want, you have a system where you don't have any government backing. You don't have an army to make the, you don't have a police force. You don't have any, anyone who can force people to do right. You don't have any means to make people be in the house of God, to make people take uh, communion, uh, to make people baptize their babies, to make people uh, give, you don't have any means to do it. This is impractical. It's not going to work long term is what he thought. Number two, the Anabaptists insisted that when a person was born again, they lived like it. Catholics, Lutherans don't teach that. As long as you come, observe the ordinances, and tithe, we're fine. Baptists wouldn't go for that. The Anabaptists, they wouldn't go for that. So no, a person who is saved carefully hearkens to observe to do all the things that the Lord's commanded. It's a wicked, it's a wicked, wicked heart that thinks, well, since I have the grace of God, I'm already saved, and God's forgiven my sins, I'm going to go to heaven, no matter what I do on this earth, I think I'll just go ahead and live like the devil. Yeah. Let God clean me up. That's a wicked heart that do that kind of thing. The believer's heart, number three, is wicked when we give, but we do not forget. And I've already mentioned forgiving a little bit, but I want to do it again. When we give, but we do not forget. Look at verses 1 and 2, Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 and 2. At the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. And in release is to forgive. You're going to forgive the debt. Someone who owes you a debt, and at the end of every seven years, you forgive the debt. There's a forgiveness that goes on there. And he says at verse 2, And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's. It's not his release. It's the Lord's release. Deuteronomy 15, verse 9. Beware that there, that there be not be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year of the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy brother, of thy poor brother, and thou givest him not. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be a sin unto thee. So the sin of the passage, first of all, uh, so he said, here's the thing. He says, uh, I, I'm telling you, God says, I'm telling you that every seven years you're to forgive all the debt. And then he says, I want you to be careful of this. Don't do this thing where you say, well, seven years, it's only six months away, so I can't give, I can't loan to you now because, uh, you know, then I'll have to forgive the debt in six months. Come back to me in seven months. Mm. So what I see here, first of all, this is a premeditated disobedience. Again, um, beware, don't do this thing, looking ahead, and six months down the road is the, 
is the year of release, the time of forgiveness. And so it wasn't one of those, don't get this idea that what happens is, uh, uh, you know, there's how we do today if you get a seven-year loan and you spread out the payments over seven years and, you know, that or And in their case, it was you'd spread out the payments over six months, you know, if you're coming to the end. It wasn't that way. The you know, loan, you know, if a person needs $500 and, they, and, and the year of release is seven years away, you the $500 and they got seven years to pay it. If a person, uh, if a, and if they don't get it paid, you forgive whatever's left. If a person comes to you six months before the release and he needs $500, you are to give him the $500. He can pay you what he can pay you. And at the end of the six months, whatever is left, he hasn't paid you, you forgive. And is there anyone in this room who wouldn't think six months from now, is no, there is no way he's going to be able to pay this off in six months. I'm not going to give him. I'm not going to give that money to him because that, I'm going to end up forgiving all of them. I learned a long time ago, my pastor taught me this, and I think so. I never loan money. If I have the money to give, I give. I never loan money. Because I don't ever want to be in a position where um, uh, you're looking at me saying, I can't, where you're, you're in a position where you won't look me in the face because you know you owe me money, and I won't look you in the face because I want to scratch your eyeballs out. Because you owe me money. If a, if a person comes to me and they have a need, I'm able to meet the need, I give. I just give it. If I can't give it freely, then I, then I just say, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do here. If I don't have it to give freely, then I just, then, you know, then I, I can do that in good conscience that God, the Lord tells me that, and it, that if I, if I have the ability to help my to help, if I don't have the ability to help, I'm not supposed to, but helping is that then I'm that I am free, that I am clear. But if I help, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna do it in such a way that I don't break the friendship over this thing. So to keep the child of God, I've got to look at my notes and see where to keep the child of God from capitalizing on the blessing where he commanded him to forgive the debt after seven years. So oh there was what it was. It was so God would give him, I'm gonna read this. For the Jew, lending was never supposed to be a business, it was supposed to be a means of God's blessings, spreading God's blessings. And to, to keep the child of God from capitalizing on the blessing of the Lord, uh, he commanded that is to forgive the dead after seven years. God's instructions were that every seven years, children of Israel they will make a release, they forgive the debt, and I'm going to skip all that because I've already done that. So um, what happens if you meet one, if you meet someone in need, but it's only six months away? God anticipated that, said, here's the thing, you give to them. You meet their need. And you learn to forgive, and, and you still forgive, because why? What you're giving was never yours in the first place. It was God's. He gave it to you so that you could give. We're forgiving. Listen, we are to forgive others before, because God has forgiven us. And uh, if you'll plan to forgive based upon the blessing of God, the blessing that God has forgiven you, then you never need to commit the sin of premeditated unforgiveness. Some of you do that, don't you? I'm not ever going to forgive that person. I won't ever do it. You think about it. If I forgive them, I mean, it's just going to come back and haunt me. It's going to bite me. I can't forgive that person. You know, I can't. No. Here's what we're supposed to do as believers. We're supposed to say God's blessing is upon us. And he has forgiven me so abundantly, I'm never going to, I'm going to always, um, I'm going to forgive a person before they've done anything to offend me. I'm not going to wait until they offend me and say, okay, well now, let's see, that offense was uh, on a scale of one to seven, that was, a, that was a number five. And so in five years, it'll take me five years to come to forgive you. Or that offense, uh, that's a one year offense, and I'll forgive you in a year. Something you're not supposed to do that. God said, here's what you do, is you live in the attitude of forgiveness. You're going to be offended. People are going to offend you. People are people. Have you figured that out? People are people. And everybody I know, and everybody offends somebody sometime. Everybody does. Including you. So here's what you do. You just learn to forgive ahead of time. Just don't let yourself pick up an offense. Don't take an offense. Uh, and, for lack of forgiveness, it's a premeditated disobedience. It's also a spiritual disobedience. Look at verse 2 with me. Verse 2, uh, after this manner, the, uh, 
and, and this is the matter of the release. Every creditor that lendeth ought unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is the Lord's release. This is God's command. This is it's God who gives. It's God who uh, who channels his forgiveness to others. It's God who channels this release because the release was the command of God, because the ability to give was the blessing of God. To release, to refuse to forgive the debt and to or to release the debt and forgive the debtor, it was a sin against God. You ever think about that? When you hold back that forgiveness, you refuse to forgive someone. You're not sinning against that person. You're not even really sinning against yourself, although you're hurting yourself. But you're sinning, and you're sinning against God. To refuse to forgive is a sin against God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 15, But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you yours. I should read it right. Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Finally, to refuse to forgive, it is vicious disobedience. Uh, he says in verse um, Nine, if thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not. There's someone who's in need, and you refuse to help. How, how many of you have ever felt like uh, you couldn't forgive someone in your heart, uh, and in your heart you wish them hurt? After all, they, they hurt you, and uh, it's only right that they be hurt back. It's a vicious thing to wish someone's hurt. Even if you feel like it's fair because they hurt you, so you want them to be hurt, it's a vicious thing, to a wicked thing, to wish the hurt of another soul. So I'm getting ready to close with this. Note that this whole passage, Deuteronomy 15, verse 1, the whole passage rests on believing in and trusting the Lord's blessing. God's blessed you. God's blessed you. Have He blessed you? Can't you? Can't, can't you? If you take even a moment to think about and reflect upon it, can't you admit and see that God has blessed you? Well, being able to be a blessing, being able to forgive someone else, being able to give to meet someone else, it, it rests on the fact that you know that you have the blessing of God in your life. And the wicked heart doesn't believe God. Just doesn't believe that God is there, that God is blessing, that God is near, that God answers his prayers, that God hears him, or whatever it is. Even if it's a person who's a believer, it is the wicked heart who says, who, who does not see that God can give you enough blessing that you can be a blessing to another person. When is the believer's heart wicked? I want to suggest to you that the, that the, the believer's heart is that the person who does not believe, or I'm sorry, I'm going to pray. When is the believer's heart wicked? It is the, uh, it, uh, a person's heart, a person who does not believe his heart is wicked. It's really more wicked than the person who knows his heart is wicked. When is the believer's heart wicked? Truthfully, a heart is always wicked, but it's more wicked, but it is more often wicked than it is not. It is filled with more wickedness than it is filled with holiness. It is the wicked heart who says, I'm offended that you think I'm wicked. And the Bible says if we will confess our if we will confess that to God, that He is faithful and just to forgive us, forgive us our sin, and it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So don't get upset at your preacher for telling that you're wicked, telling you that you're wicked. What you ought to do instead is just humble yourself and confess that it's true and be a blessing to others as God has blessed you. Heavenly Father, I want to ask you now that your Holy Spirit will bless as we Prepare now for just a time of invitation, a response. Heavenly Father, here's the, here's the thing that seems to me like is so obvious from this passage, is that um, we, our hearts are wicked when we're not, um, when we aren't uh, acknowledging your blessing. Once we come to a place where we understand that the blessings of God uh, are abundant and they just poured down upon us. Once we understand that, it's not at all difficult to give, and it's not at all difficult to forgive when we know that we don't need what someone else can give to us because you are meeting our needs more than abundantly when we can come to that place. Um, wicked heart. Always stingy and selfish, and mostly it's stingy and selfish with uh, the blessing of God cannot see you in their life, cannot see your blessings in their life. So Heavenly 
Father, I want to ask you today that you help all of us to see that the, the truth is that everyone here, every one of us, tend to wickedness. Every one of us tend to selfishness, tend to hoard for ourselves. And even if we're talking about the blessings of God, the faith of God, or uh, you know the grace of God, the mercy of God, we tend to hoard those things. Where we are, we've been forgiven of our sins, and yet there's someone we can't forgive. Uh, we've got salvation. We've been saved for eternity, and yet we don't tell someone else how to be saved. And we have, uh, and uh, we have been forgiven of our offenses, and 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 yet we won't forgive someone else of theirs. Lord God, I, I ask you, Heavenly Father, that you can help us to be uh, humble and honest today, and that we would confess to you uh, our own wickedness. And then, Heavenly Father, that we would uh, offer ourselves to you to be channels of blessing, channels of forgiveness, channels of mercy, channels of grace, channels of faith. Heavenly Father, I, I pray if there's somebody here today who's never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, that this morning they would come and let us show them from the Word of God how to be saved without question. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. There's a personal life who has to live um, this time on earth without the assurance that heaven is their home. So, Heavenly Father, I just pray for you today now that you work in this invitation. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If your heads are bowed and your eyes closed, then I'll invite you to stand. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The piano is playing right now. What we're going to do is we're going to begin an invitation song in just a moment. Pastor Caleb is begin, going to begin to sing. And here's what we're going to invite you to come and respond to the message. You don't have to respond to me. It's not like I'm up here and I, I'm not God. I am merely a preacher of God's word. But if God's Holy Spirit has spoken to you in the message today, we want to give you an opportunity to come to speak to God about that, to respond.